College football practice has started in Stillwater already, and the Sooners are getting ready to go next week. Hello, I'm Oklahoma Deputy Sports Editor Mike Taylor, and welcome to the first edition of the Bedlam Nation Conversation presented by Dodge. Joining me today are OU football beat writer Jake Trotter and OSU football beat writer Scott Wright. Today we'll talk OU and OSU football and debate some of the hottest topics in college sports. First up, OU. Jake, OU looks good coming back, ranked number four in the USA Today preseason poll. Is this the best returning offensive unit since Bob Stoops has been the coach? They got a lot of good players coming back, not the best unit. That goes to the uh, the 4 team. They had the returning Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback in Jason White. Uh, they had three NFL caliber receivers. Uh, and then obviously he wasn't a returner, but you insert Adrian Peterson, and you're talking yeah, about the, be- bad. the best preseason offense. Uh, you could make a case that the uh, national championship team in 2000, coming off 99, was second because they had Josh Heupel, uh, who would end up finish second in the Heisman. Uh, they had a lot of playmakers at wide receiver. Um, and then they had Quentin Griffin at running back, too. And, and both the offensive lines on those teams were good. So I would probably place this team at best uh, number three. Just talk a few about a few of those guys who are coming back and kind of the preseason honors that some of them already gotten. Well, there's a a lot of good pieces coming back on this offense. You start with the offensive line. Uh, Duke Robinson was a consensus All American last year. Uh, he, John Cooper, and Phil Oldholt uh, are uh, were voted preseason first team All Big Twelve. You talk about Jermaine Gresham, who's a Mackey Award uh, watch list candidate, and uh, Joaquin Iglesias and Manuel Johnson. People forget about those wide receivers. They've been in the rotation for four years, been three-year starters. So they're veterans, and they're going to give quarterback Sam Bradford, who, by the way, led the nation in passing efficiency last year, a lot of weapons to work with. But the guy to watch and the key, I think, for this offense is DeMarco Murray. He's coming off a, a kneecap injury, but he's a guy that can make things happen. He had, I think, 13 rushing touchdowns last year, which was best on the team, and he didn't even play at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. He's an electrifying guy, and he's, he's a guy that can make this offense go from good to elite. All righty, we're going to be right back with the Bedlam Nation conversation, but first, a quick word from Dodge. Welcome back to the Bedlam Nation conversation brought to you by Dodge. Right now, OSU is turned on the clock. Scott Wright, practice started yesterday, and Coach Mike Gundy has said that backup quarterback is the biggest concern for his team as they get ready for the season. True? Well, it's really a question that we're not going to know the actual answer to until the season's over because it's going to depend a lot on whether or not Zach Robinson gets hurt. That's, that's the, whole, the whole purpose of having a, a number two guy ready to go. If Zach goes down, they're going to they're gonna need somebody ready to go in that spot. They don't have a, a, a proven quarterback in, in the number two spot. They don't have anybody with any real meaningful experience in Alex, Kate, and Brandon Wheaton. Both talented players, but they need to get one of those, figure out who is that guy and, and get him as much, uh, as much work as they can so that if that happens, uh, with, with Zach getting hurt, that, that that guy's ready to go. If, uh, if Zach doesn't get hurt, defense is definitely the number one concern. But Zach really makes the offense go. I mean, everything is, is uh, focused around him. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. And, uh, and so if, if he were to go down and one of those backups had to come in, the offense would, would change a little bit, not as much option because neither of those guys move as well as Zach does. Uh, but they have some other playmakers around him. They've got three talented running backs, uh, Brandon Pettigrew at tight end, uh, and Des Bryant, some other talented wide receivers. So uh, they'll utilize their other talent more if, uh, if they were to have to go to one of those backups. Tell us a little bit about Kate and Whedon just to wrap up. Uh, what did they bring to the table as far as know anything that we know about them? Well, the, Brandon Whedon is the guy that's, uh, that's going to get noticed first because, number one, he's, he's 6'4 and about 230 pounds. He's a, a big guy out there, and, and he's got that 95-mile-an-hour uh, that fastball that had him playing in, in, the, <laughs> right. uh, in the minor leagues for a while. So he can, uh, he can really fire the ball. Uh, Alex Kate moves around a little bit better, not as big, only about 6'1, maybe 200 pounds. And, uh, and, and he's a real accurate thrower, uh, that, though he doesn't have the gun that, uh, that Whedon does. All righty. We'll be right back with the Bedlam Nation conversation again, but first, a quick word from Dodge. Welcome back to the Bedlam Nation conversation brought to you by Dodge. This segment, the point-counterpoint segment, where every week we're going to debate different issues, hot issues in the world of college sports. This week, guys, we wrote about this on Sunday. Given the really weak non-conference schedules of some of the Big 12 schools, should strength of schedule be factored back into the BCS ranking? It's been taken out, but maybe that's made people make weak schedules. What do you guys think, Jake? I think it should be. Uh, first of all, you brought up a good point. A lot of weak schedules in the non-conference uh, that aren't 
accounted for when we're trying to determine who should play for the national championship. That game should be about the teams most deserving uh, of playing in the national championship, and the most deserving teams are the ones that have beaten the best teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see a lot of scenarios in which a a team will go through the non-conference not having played anyone, maybe in a league that's down, and, and all of a sudden they're 11, 12, and 0, and uh, the favorites to go to the national championship game. A classic case of this is West Virginia, mm -hmm. who uh, in the Big East doesn't have the same caliber of schedule that maybe a Pac-10 or a Big 12 or an SEC uh, team has, and yet they're in the national picture at the end of the year because they're undefeated or have one loss because they haven't played the same kind of schedule. I think you should be rewarded for who you play and who you beat. What do you think, Scott? Is this, is this going to be good for college football or bad? Do you think it should be put back in? I, d I don't think it should. I think that, that people forget that it really is a part of this, even though it's not. You know, it, it used to be a separate category in the BCS formula. It's not anymore. But the computers all still take it into account. The human polls should, uh, if, if you're uh, if you're worth if you're paying in, attention, in, yeah. in voting. So, so I think that I, I think that there are problems with scheduling, but I don't think that uh, that strength of schedule in the BCS uh, in the BCS formula is going to fix that. It's not going to uh, impact how uh, how Baylor is scheduled. Well, you think too many teams are using the week non-conference to kind of build up their programs. Kansas State did it back in the day. Kansas, I think, did it in the past couple of years. Is that a good or a bad thing? Yeah. Well, here's the deal. The upper echelon teams that are competing for national championships, they tend to play marquee non-conference games, at least one of them. But then you look at the other games that they're playing, and they're pretty much a lot of times horrible. Tennessee, Chattanooga, for instance. Yeah, and, <laughs> and uh, you know Texas has been the same way. They mm -hmm. might play a decent non-conference team like a TCU, but then they're playing Arkansas States of the world, too. So I think I think uh, their marquee non-conference game in the next couple of years is Wyoming. So um, I think that... Yeah, we should let the humans determine uh, what who should play for the national championship too. But sometimes they don't look at strength of schedule uh, like they should uh, in determining a national championship uh, contender. All righty, guys, I appreciate it. Uh, that's our point counterpoint segment. We'll be right back with the Bedlam Nation conversation. But first, the word from Dodge. And welcome back to the Bedlam Nation conversation brought to you by Dodge. Final segment, Fearless Forecast. This week, the guys are going to talk about what they think the records are going to be for the teams this season. Scott, we're going to start with you. Expectations are high in Stillwater. Ask Boone Pickens, for crying out loud. What do you think their final record is going to be, and what do you think some of the critical games are going to be during the stretch? Right now, as far as the final record, I'm saying that this is a this is a seven and five team. It could be a, a, when you get to the end of the year, it might feel a little bit uh, a little bit rough for Oklahoma State fans because there's a good chance that they're seven and two going into the final three games. where you have got uh, at Texas, at Colorado, and then uh, and then the Bedlam game in Stillwater. Uh, so so losing those last three is going to make you feel like you're on a little bit of a downer. But seven and five is is a pretty good schedule against or a pretty good record against a tough schedule. Um, they've got to get started strong against Washington State. Uh, Mike Gundy has said that he doesn't want to make the players feel like this is a uh, uh, an all-or-nothing type of game. He felt like he did that too much with the Georgia opener last year, and after they lost it, the, it kind of took the wind out of their sails. So he, he wants them treating it like another game, but it's really a, a big game. If they can win that one, uh, there's a good chance that they're 4-0 going into conference play when they open with Texas A&M. Good chance they win that one as well. So uh, And then it, it comes down to that last part of the schedule with Texas and Oklahoma and, and Texas Tech and, the, and, and those people. Jake, expectations even higher in Norman with uh, th thoughts of another trip to a BCS Bowl. What are you saying about the record and where do you think the differences could be made? Well, I've examined Oklahoma's schedule uh, intensely and I would have to say that <laughs> they're going to be favored by at least seven points in every single game this year, excluding the Big 12 championship. Even Texas, I think they're going to be a touchdown favorite in that game, maybe six, six and a half. So when you look at that, you think, well, OU should win every game this year. So I'm going to predict... Uh, a 12 and one season, and here's why I, I'm going to say that they're going to lose a game. Any more in college football with the parity, going on the road is tough. It, it's really difficult to go undefeated during the regular season. We saw LSU won the national title with two losses, um, you know, heading into their championship game. So I think that to say that someone's going to go undefeated, I think that's really tough in college football unless you're playing in a weak conference. So I think they might slip up somewhere, but I still think that they are going to be uh, the South Division champ, and I think that they're going to uh, probably be the favorite in the Big 12 championship game, even if it's Missouri at Kansas City. Playing for a national championship? 
Well, I think that they're one of three or four teams that could. It just kind of comes down to who beat who and who, you know, who lost when. Um, I think they're one of five or six teams that could be in that conversation towards the end of the year. Uh, it's really just going to come down to uh, what voters are thinking at that point and, and how the BCS uh, computer rankings are going. But uh, I certainly think that if they go 12-1 and one, uh, during the, uh, the regular season of the Big 12 title, they'll be right there. All righty. Thank you uh, for watching the Battle Nation conversation. Be sure to follow the best college football coverage in the country in the Oklahoman and online in News OK. And to share your thoughts about OU and OSU sports, become a member, member of BedlamNation.com. Thanks for watching the Bedlam Nation conversation, brought to you by our friends at Dodge.